Hello viewers and welcome to the Woke Africa Show. My name is Ejewa and I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our new subscribers. Thank you so much you guys. We're just a thousand uh, and some you know numbers but since yesterday to today we are about 1120 and beyond. So thank you so much you guys. I really do appreciate your subscription. I'd like also like to say a big thank you to my existing subscribers you guys you make everything happen on this channel and i'm grateful for that thank you so much if you are new on this channel please kindly subscribe all right just look at the subscription button down there yes subscribe click it and there is a bell behind beside it right beside it beside it please click the top bell with a yin yang on it yes and kindly uh uh uh, you know get ready for notifications whenever i upload new videos also guys for some time you guys have been asking me how you can support this channel well we have a patreon account now you can support us on patreon at www.patreon forward slash uh, patreon.com forward slash the woke africa show we really appreciate your concern and we believe that with your support we can grow this channel to the point where we can bring you more quality videos. Now you can also follow us on Instagram at um, woke underscore Africa underscore show. Um, you can also f uh, follow us on Facebook at the woke Africa show uh, on Facebook. So please. You can also email us at the woke Africa show at gmail.com. I have put all the description, the details in the description box. So you can definitely check us out from there. Also remember that we have the global black family WhatsApp page that you can actually join. So please send me a quick email with your details and I, I will add you to it if you're interested. Well, now, so yesterday we shared a compelling uh, uh, documentary you know, uh, detailing the origins of the COVID-19 virus. Now, it's important for all black people and anyone who might be interested to educate themselves about such situations that are going on around us. So, to not, uh, not to delay your time any further, please kindly stay tuned and we'll be right back. Just take a look at this video, the part two. Sorry, take a look at the part two of the video. Thank you so much. January 23rd, 2020, the Wuhan virus exploded. While Wuhan announced the lockdown of the city, Xi Jiangli and her team released a paper stating that the Wuhan coronavirus was of probable bat origin. This was published in Nature on February 3rd. The paper indicated that the Wuhan virus utilized the same key as SARS to gain entry into the human body. She also announced the 2019 NCOV genome sequence was 96.2% consistent with a bat coronavirus originating in Yunnan, China, called RATG13, signaling a natural source of the Wuhan virus. However, Xi Jiangli's natural origin assertion was doubtful. The outbreak occurred in Wuhan, the same location as the P4 laboratory where she was based and which housed highly similar viruses. Common sense would lead the government to first inspect the P4 laboratory for any leakage incident and potential safety concerns. Instead, they shifted public attention from the P4 laboratory to the South China Seafood Wholesale Market that sold no bats and designated it as the origin of the disease. At the same time, authorities sealed off all virus samples prevented international experts from joining the investigation, and used national television to slander doctors such as Li Wenliang, who disclosed the outbreak for spreading rumors. If the Wuhan virus indeed emerged naturally, why would the CCP need to censor relevant news or block investigations? Could the Wuhan P4 laboratory have its secrets? Virus samples and genome sequences maybe the exact ingredients we need to find our answers. When I first heard of the coronavirus, I was deeply concerned. Almost every disease that starts in China 
begins in Guangdong province, the province that surrounds Hong Kong in the south. But Wuhan is in the central portion of the country. And so this was extremely unusual. And the fact that it might have started close to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the P4 Biosafety Lab, really was extremely troubling. It's not a conspiracy theory to think that the coronavirus came from the Wuhan lab. We don't know at this point. And until we know, the theory about the lab origin is certainly something that we should consider. I noticed that after the outbreak, the Wuhan Institute of Virology kept strangely quiet. Under normal circumstances, as the nation's highest level of virology research institute, it should be the first one to actively respond when the entire country is working around the clock attempting to control a disease like this. One that so closely fits the type of viruses its scientists were researching. In contrast, the Institute had a highly visible demonstration on CCTV of their efforts to detect and prevent the outbreak of virus V in pigs of Guangdong in 2018. It should be noted that the Wuhan Institute displayed a series of abnormal events since the start of 2020. January 2nd, an email from the Director General of the Institute to all internal staff was circulated. The subject was, Notice regarding the strict prohibition of disclosure of any information related to the Wuhan unknown pneumonia. National Health Commission clearly mandates that all detection, empirical data, results, and conclusions related to this outbreak cannot be published on self-media or social media, nor disclosed to any media, including state media, or collaborative organizations, including any technical services companies. January 21st, a new drug, Remdesivir, provided for free by the United States to China for Wuhan coronavirus treatment was preemptively patented by the Institute. February 3rd, Dr. Wu Xiaohua blew the whistle using his real name that Xi Zhengli's haphazard laboratory management may have led the Wuhan virus to leak from the lab. February 4th, Chairman of Duo Yi, Xu Bo, blew the whistle using his real name, that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was suspected of manufacturing and leaking the Wuhan virus. February 7th, top biochemical weapon expert of the People's Liberation Army, Chen Wei, officially assumed control over Wuhan Institute of Virology's P4 laboratory. February 14th, Chinese leader Xi Jinping called for the inclusion of biosecurity into China's national security framework and to accelerate the introduction of a biosecurity law. February 15, the Institute refuted widely spread rumors on Chinese social media that a female graduate, Huang Yanling, was patient zero and had perished. However, Huang's photo, CV, and thesis were all removed from the Institute's official website, leaving only her name. February 17, Institute researcher Chen Chuanjiao blew the whistle using her real name that Director General of the Institute, Wang Yanyi, was suspected of leaking the virus. I graduated from the University of Virginia in 1980. My first job was to go to the National Cancer Institute, which was housed at Fort Detrick, Maryland, the same place that houses the USAMRID, U.S. Army Research Institute on Infectious Disease, the biosafety level four facility equivalent of the Wuhan facility. And so at these facilities, it's where investigators who I went in there myself, you can see the breakdowns in safety and it's everywhere. That's why I have no doubt the Chinese biosafety level four it was just as lacking in safety, in rigor. You can argue that they don't care. Suspected of leaking the virus, military biochemical weapons expert assumes control. 
biosecurity law. Now, when these sensitive keywords are connected together, it tells me that the P4 laboratory is not an ordinary academic research institute. I decided to start from the beginning of the Wuhan P4 lab. On January 23rd, the day Wuhan was locked down, French website challenges.fr published an article that revealed many details of the collaboration between France and China to establish the P4 laboratory in Wuhan. In 2003, after the SARS outbreak in China, the Chinese Academy of Sciences requested assistance from the French government to build a virology research center of the highest level. With the support of then French Prime Minister Raffarin, the two countries signed a contract to jointly construct the P4 laboratory under a wave of contention. According to the contract, French architect RTV in Lyon was responsible for the engineering of the laboratory. However, Chinese authorities switched the work to a local Wuhan architect, IPPR, based on research conducted by the General Directorate of External Security. IPPR had close ties to subsidies of the Chinese military, some of which were already targets of concern by the American CIA. Within the 12 subsidiary departments, there was even a specific military management office. The French delayed repeatedly, given security concerns. It wasn't until 2017 before the Wuhan P4 laboratory was operational, and French security continued to suspect that the Chinese regime was conducting biochemical weapons experiments. Who is the real boss of the P4 laboratory? The Wuhan P4 laboratory was a subsidiary of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is managed by China Academy of Sciences. The director of the laboratory was Yuan Ming, who was also the head of Chinese Academy of Sciences Wuhan chapter. Design and funding for construction were the responsibilities of the ex-vice presidents of the academy. Jiang Mianheng from 1999 to 2011, and Chen Zhu from 2000 to 2007. Jiang Mianheng was the eldest son of ex-CCP leader Jiang Zemin. After Jiang Zemin ascended to power after the Tiananmen Square massacre, his son entered the academy and led the Institute of High Technology's research and development. Jiang Mianheng created the Shanghai Institute of Life Sciences, and together with China Academy of Sciences, Shanghai Colleges and Universities, Shanghai Hospitals, military hospitals and research institutions, formed a profit group of life sciences organizations. They controlled China's major life sciences research projects and allocation of massive funding. Jiang Jicheng, son of Jiang Mianheng, is the controlling shareholder of Wuxi Aptech, which in turn is controlling Fosun Pharmaceutical, China's agent for Remdesivir. Effectively, Jiang Ji Cheng is the kingpin behind the specific medicine for the outbreak. Meanwhile, Chen Zhu is the current president of the Red Cross Society of China, which had faced numerous scandals since the outbreak. In 1999, while Jiang Zemin was in power, the People's Liberation Army published a book, Unrestricted Warfare, in which strategies for a weaker nation to combat a stronger nation are discussed in the context of modern warfare. One of the authors, Chiao Liang, wrote, After the first Taiwan Strait crisis, we realized that if the Chinese and American military fought head-on, we are at a disadvantage. Therefore, we need a new strategy to help our military tilt the balance of power. This new strategy is called unrestricted warfare. A variety of means beyond all limits, without any restrictions. It could be military related, including guerrilla warfare, terrorism, biochemical warfare, or it could be non-military related, such as drug trafficking, poisoning, environmental destruction, and computer virus dissemination. Israeli expert in biological warfare and former intelligence officer Danny Shoham published a paper in 2015 in India's Journal of Defense Studies. 
He pointed out that China will not miss, skip, or abandon any highly advanced technology, especially military-related technology. The article noted that China had 12 facilities related to the Ministry of National Defense and 30 subsidiary facilities of the PLA participating in the research, development, manufacturing, testing, or storage of biological weapons. Dr. Francis Boyle, a Harvard PhD famous for drafting the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, clearly expressed the novel coronavirus we're seeing here is an offensive biological warfare weapon. The Federation of American Scientists indicated similar concerns in an evaluation report. The organization believed that the CCP possessed advanced chemical warfare projects, including research, development, manufacturing, and weaponizing capabilities. The CCP is usually known to have a proactive biological warfare portfolio, including state-funded and sponsored research activities. I believe they have them. I believe they they're developing them. I think they want to be the most advanced nation on earth when it comes to biological weapons. The same as I believe that they do forced organ harvesting. The way I say the same as I believe that they have、uh, concentration camps for Uyghurs. The way I believe that they have systematically killed millions of Falun Gong. It, it is the same thing. This regime, you can count on it. So Wuhan is an area I think is critical by the fact that there's a lot of concern about what China's ambitions are regarding long-term global domination. I'll just say it that their military doctrines indicated that they intend to be the dominant political and military force in the Pacific Rim. I've talked to senior members of the Trump administration who have had conversations with the senior Chinese generals, and that's what they basically say. It's in their doctrine too. So we have to examine. This new clue—that's this is one piece of the you know Wuhan biological warfare—is that does this mean something to these other things we're already seeing? Because the Chinese have already kind of stated this is their objective. So I think we have to analyze it through that lens. What does this mean to the larger political narrative of what China wants to do to dominate the region and potentially the world? We don't have to speculate about being at war. Last May, the Communist Party through People's Daily. Carried a piece which said that there was a "quote-unquote" people's war against the United States. They've declared war on us. We have to respond. There is a war. China's told us there's one. At present, the Wuhan coronavirus pandemic has spread to about 190 countries. With no signs of slowing down, the United States announced a state of national emergency. Europe became the new center of the outbreak. The world's largest art museum, the Louvre, and the Eiffel Tower closed to the public. Tragic scenes, previously only found in Hollywood films, are now playing out live on the world stage. And given how closely it seemed to align with the Chinese regime's narratives, I can't help but question the role the WHO had. In this catastrophic pandemic, well, I think all you have to do is look at the photo of Tejos and Xi shaking hands. Xi standing there, Tejos going up to there, and it really is indicative of how China controls many of these international institutions. You can see that the WHO is essentially. Following Chinese Communist Party's guidelines,、um, you can see that the UN Human Rights Council is similarly following what China does. From the very beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, the Communist Party has done its best to prevent the CDC and others from studying the origin of this disease. We don't know what's there, but the fact that、uh, the Communist Party is covering this up is, shouldn't trouble us deeply. Then you see the World Health Organization take over. YouTube, and what's amazing is now at the bottom of every YouTube video, even from Chris Martinson with his、uh, with his daily updates, he's just reading facts. Now it's the World Health Organization is a forced link to go to the site. So for any person who doesn't know what, who the World Health Organization, they go there to get the propaganda, not the facts, not the truth. They get the propaganda, they get the talking points from the World Health Organization, and that is also very. It's a shame that American corporations. Especially social media, 
like Google, like Facebook and Twitter, they're trying to censor or, or ban or shadow ban or manipulate algorithms, so on and so forth, to prevent an actual honest conversation. The best way this is going to be answered, all this, we want the truth. The biggest issue I've learned over my 40 year career, it's not really fighting the viruses and learning how to treat the viruses. It's fighting a system that is determined to cover up and persecute anyone who reveals the truth behind. Today, the World Bank, many of the international institutions have essentially adopted a posture whereby if the Chinese Communist Party tells them to do it, they're going to do it. I'm not surprised at all by what the WHO says. I'm not surprised at all by IKO, which basically has been blocking people from that tweet about Taiwan. I mean, the, the whole system, and this is why, by the way, the national security strategy that came out in December 2017 says what it says, which is we need to protect our societies, not just the United States, but all democracies. We need to rebuild them not invest Chinese Communist Party regime in the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025. And we need to inspire people again to believe in democracy. Every country has diseases, but in China, they become national emergencies and global emergencies because the real disease here is communism. A sprawling and aggressive disinformation campaign unleashed globally by the Chinese Communist Party. The propaganda push, which has escalated in recent weeks, aims primarily to deflect blame over the Chinese regime's botched handling of the Wuhan coronavirus, to sow discord internationally, and to portray the image that the regime has contained the outbreak. During the investigative interview process, well-known scientists who once suggested a laboratory origin of the virus declined to be interviewed one after another. Some avoided the topic of virus origin completely. Some had already composed scientific arguments but abruptly retracted their papers. I felt as if a giant net of censorship was cast by the CCP over virologists around the world. Silence at this time could have consequences for the health and lives of billions of people. I watch CNN, I watch Fox, I watch CBS, uh, and I try to make my own assessment. And a lot of the time, you can figure out what's really going on by what they're not saying. And in this case, there's a lot of things not being said. Bottom line, they want to make money from China. They fear the Chinese repercussions if they air this stuff. It just gives you an indication of how powerful the Chinese Communist Party is. The Chinese Communist Party suppressing speech in the West because these companies make money from China and they're afraid that they're not going to make the Chinese Communist Party is going to punish them if they essentially publish this stuff or allow it to be aired. There is no other reason. I think we have to recognize your audience who haven't seen it, I highly recommend Chernobyl because the same basic governance model that screwed up Chernobyl, I would argue, is now in charge of the response of the coronavirus. So whatever you saw go wrong in Chernobyl, you could still see that potential here. I'm not saying it's going to be that bad. I'm just saying that the party, the central party, is the thing which they want to protect their power. And people and nation issues are secondary to the continuation of power. The Communist Party is malign and it is grossly irresponsible. It has pressured governments to keep their borders open, and it had to know that that would result in the fast spread of coronavirus to other countries. This is uh, the worst sort of behavior, and the world's got to understand that there will not be peace, there will not be good order and stability in the world as long as the Communist Party rules China. The Wall Street Journal writes a piece as China is a sick man of Asia. It needs to be corrected. It's not. China is a sick man of Asia. It is a communist Chinese party that's a sick man of Asia. The communist party has policies that people abhor. And it's not just its reaction to the coronavirus. We see this with the suppression of rights, also with the holding uh, perhaps a million people, maybe even three million people in concentration camps. So um, this is just the essential nature of Chinese communism. Chinese communism is evil. While China pretends to be a responsible member of the international community, in reality, they are doing much to undermine the rule of law and human rights. We at the Epoch Times refer to the Wuhan coronavirus, or COVID-19, 
as the CCP virus. Because the Chinese Communist Party's cover-up and mishandling allowed the virus to spread throughout China and create a global pandemic. On March 24th, Texas lawyer Larry Klayman filed a complaint in Texas federal court seeking at least $20 trillion from the Chinese government. Klayman said in a statement, quote, The Chinese people are a good people, but their government is not, and it must be made to pay dearly. On April 4th, the British think tank Henry Jackson Society advocated for compensation of 351 billion pounds from the CCP to the UK. And that the government should pursue it through international courts. The same report called for a total compensation of 3.2 trillion pounds to the G7 for the damages caused by the cover-up of the outbreak. On the same day, the All India Bar Association filed a complaint to the United Nations Human Rights Council, seeking an unspecified amount as reparations from China over the global spread of the coronavirus. Evidently, the CCP violated the international health regulations. The United States and the international community must regain their senses and take action. Reveal the truth through investigations, initiate sanctions against the CCP, and seek massive restitution for the worldwide public health emergency, resulting in tremendous health and economic loss. As the people of Taiwan and Hong Kong are insisting, only by trying to stay away from the CCP's invasion can we protect ourselves in this global disaster. Let's start protecting ourselves. Let's start rebuilding our country. Let's start investing in our people. Let's start inspiring people to love democracy and transparency and open markets, not what the Chinese have, which is essentially, if you read document number nine, counter to every single one of those things. So, I mean, it gives us a real opportunity to kind of reevaluate the kind of world we want to live in and fight for the right side of that world. I want them to see the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party because when they do, they're going to wake up. And when that happens, democracies will begin to th flourish again. And when that happens, perhaps, just perhaps, the people of China will have a chance. This virus must have a message for all of us as people of this earth. We need to take a break from our busy schedules and seriously consider the repercussions of our ever-expanding scientific research and development. Did we go too far? Do our desires and ambitions go against the laws of nature and pull us further from the direction given by heaven? Maybe when this virus lifts, we can again find our traditional values, rediscover kindness and virtue, family and community. I believe that viruses can't survive where hearts have compassion.
So guys, <laughs> I have learned something. I've learned so much. And I believe you have to. If you've learned something and you think that people deserve to know, please kindly sh click the share button and share on all your social media, guys. On all your social media. Um, I would like to remind you again that you can support us on Patreon uh, at patreon.com forward slash the woke Africa show to help us, you know, uh, bring up more educative and interesting videos. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. I thank you and appreciate all of you. Please, please, I'd like to know what you think. Leave your comments in the comment section, okay? Don't just watch and let's go. Please leave us your comment as I want to know what you think about our videos. Thank you so much and have a fantastic day. Cheers.